Did you have a birth or breastfeeding experience that you would have never expected you had before you were doing it? Today, my guest describes not only choosing a birth setting she never thought she would have chosen, but also breastfeeding for way longer than she ever expected, all while returning to work part-time at just a few weeks postpartum. This story is a great example of doing diligent planning to get the outcomes that you want, but also being flexible in the moment when plans need to change. So welcome to the Milk Making Minutes. I'm your host, Lo Nigrosh, an international board certified lactation consultant and a certified childbirth educator on a mission to help you feel good about your breastfeeding journey. Hi, Ariana. Welcome to the Milk Making Minutes. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> so good to be here. Uh, so why don't you introduce yourself and your family? Sure. I am a mom. Um, I, at the time of this recording, have a you know, seven and three quarters year old. <laughs> Um, and then professionally, um, I often say I'm a public health social worker by training and have worked across many different maternal, child, infant health types of um, projects and work, um, really spanning from, from infancy to, to the childbearing years. And um, have had the chance to do that in community settings, clinical settings, school-based settings, um, in kind of across the Americas. So it's, it's been a lot of learning over the years and, you know, it's still a field that I love working in. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. And you say across the Americas, meaning both Central, North and South America? Yeah. So um, primarily as a researcher, have worked um, with kind of a, uh, America's lens, Latin America and the Caribbean, um, and then practice-wise um, have been based in the States or in Mexico um, doing one-on-one -on -one work. And I'm guessing you came to this um, line of work honestly through your own experiences, <laughs> and you do talk about that a little bit in the book as well. So let's start there. And before we do. I would love to take you way back to your earliest memories and have you talk about what your exposure to baby feeding was uh, during your childhood. Yeah. So I have two younger sisters. Um, one is four years younger, one is six years younger. So I don't have like cohesive memories. And we were all breastfed. Um, and I don't have memories, like, I can't remember literally sitting next to my mom or anything, but there are pictures of her nursing my sister, one of my sisters, and me, like, nursing a doll <laughs> next oh, to her. Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing that pops into mind. Um, and then I had cousins who um, gave birth before me and my sister-in-law, um, two sister-in-laws, um, and none of them uh, breastfed. Um, and so I feel like I had exposure to like the range of <laughs> ways that you um, can feed new babies. And um, and interestingly enough, in, in my training, there there's a track of people who were kind of on a lactation focused track, and I wasn't necessarily on that track. So professionally, I didn't have a whole lot more knowledge, you might say, or exposure to, you know, your average first time mom. Um, and so I really, I really credit um, kind of the, the care providers I had around me with with being able to provide me with that education around um, infant feeding. Okay, so you had some friends and cousins who had babies before you, and then when you got pregnant, what were you thinking in terms of what you would do postpartum and also how you would feed your baby? I essentially tried to make myself a client. Anything that I would do with a client and walking them through the maternity leave planning, postpartum planning, I basically held space to walk myself through that because I was also self-employed and didn't have access to paid leave. I was in Mexico and in Mexico, there is a paid leave program, but it's work, like a worker based. And so there isn't an option for self-employed people. Um, and so 
I remember doing a lot of planning and a lot of reading. And at one point, my midwife, I worked with a Wifery team. She was like, I think you need to maybe stop reading stuff for a while and just see what your intuition is telling you. (laughs) Wise, wise words. And I think at the time I was hyper focused on birth related things and not much postpartum except the financial planning piece. I lived in a state of Mexico, Quintana Roo, that had about an 87% cesarean birth rate, both in public and private institutions, very wow. high. Ah. Um, and so compared to the World Health Organization recommended around 15%, it's, it's very high. So the reality that most people who give birth in hospital settings end up having cesareans for a variety of reasons. And so I thought a lot about how I didn't want an automatic outcome to be a cesarean. And so I ended up opting for a home birth, which is not something I ever dreamed about or thought about before just looking at the data. And then I was like, well, statistically, if I don't want that outcome, my best, (laughs) my best chance at having experiencing physiological birth is, is at home. Midwives do not have, for the most part, hospital privileges in Mexico. And so you, the chance that kind of a midwifery model of care is, is either home birth, or there are now more birth centers, but there wasn't very many at the time and not at the place where I lived. Were you in a city, a major city? I was in a city, Playa del Carmen, which is like a, it's 40 minutes from Cancun, which is probably the nearest big city. So small city. And what is the climate around choosing home birth in the state where you were? Were there restrictions, legal restrictions? Was it hard to find a midwife or was that pretty smooth? Yeah. In Mexico, like many of the Americas, there's a very strong indigenous midwifery tradition that Mm -hmm. has been pushed out of any mainstream birthing institutions. And so at the time, I was also very involved professionally in a midwifery association that was emerging. And so there was an active kind of advocacy campaign around, around training midwives, around the midwifery model of care, but it was definitely like fringe on the fringe Mm -hmm. and they provided full spectrum care. So I received all my prenatal and birth and postpartum care with this practice. There's not kind of a professional level certification process in the way that there is in the U.S. So a lot of midwives are trained through apprenticeship models. In some communities, it's, it's like a gift and you are you're either born with the gift or you're not and you then go on to apprentice so there's also some some midwives who were trained abroad and who are who have some kind of license or licensure certification in their country of origin but come to mexico and are practicing you know uh, independently essentially so are you of mexican descent I am. Okay. Yeah, my mom is from the States. My dad's from Mexico. Okay. Um, I grew up kind of going back and forth. Um, I've moved back and forth like seven, seven times now. Uh, and I've been in the States for, for about six years since our last move. Okay. So you grew up as a bilingual person? I did. Yeah. Okay. I guess that's something I didn't mention at the front. Very much identify as part of a like binational, bicultural, bilingual. Yeah. The reason I ask that is because um, I've had the opportunity to talk to quite a few people who have delivered in a country that is different from their country of origin and navigating maternity care in your own language is hard enough. So if you were doing this, even as a highly proficient second language speaker, that's totally different than doing it as a native speaker, but you are a native speaker of both English and Spanish. And so nav was navigating, getting your maternity care in Mexico, just as easy as it would have been in the United States, just as far as the language goes and being able to discuss what you wanted and what your hopes were and 
talking over risks and benefits? Did you find that challenging or did it feel the same as it would have in English? That's a great question. And because I don't have a comparison, I only have the one child. The one right. It's yeah. hard to know. What would it have been like in the States? I don't think I would have ended up with a home birth in the States, to be honest. I think mm. I would have felt like, oh, okay. You know, I, st- I probably still would have looked at birth outcomes at an institutional level. But I suspect that I probably would have given birth at some kind of facility. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And as soon as I started talking to people in where I was living in Mexico, I I knew I did not want to give birth at a facility. (laughs) So what were the things that you were learning from people about why it was important for you to be out of hospital? Yeah. So, um, and uh, I feel like I should say content warning for anyone who (laughs) is about to listen and if you want to avoid inhumane hospital practices, maybe pause this, there's a high prevalence of what as a researcher, I would call obstetric violence, Mm. there's very little decision making left to the birth person. There is routine practices that even if they aren't always implemented are like considered standards of care. So being able to move freely, being able to have a supportive person in the room with you. None of that is allowed, even at quote unquote, the like most modern, highest, what you would think of as highest quality facilities. Mm -hmm. And which also correlates around like income of the population who goes there. There's not a lot of skin to skin going on, not a lot of leaving the infant in the room going on. A lot of taking infants and having their first feed be formula, regardless of what a parent has requested. So I had heard about these things professionally. And then once I had community in the area too. And so people who had given birth, who were working with doulas, who were really like how to plan for pain management and just time over time had basically no opportunities to any of the things that they would have liked to have. Yeah. So why don't you go ahead and get into how all that went for you? You can give as much information about the birth as you feel is needed, knowing that really the focus is the baby feeding. Yeah. So I ended up, as as you might guess from the conversation so far, having a home birth. Uh-huh. And one of the first things they did was like literally the baby came out and they just put him on my chest. And, um, you know, in hindsight, it it all happened so fast. I remember him, my son, nursing or at least latching within like the first couple of minutes, even while I was on a stool and I hadn't even gotten off the stool yet. Eventually I was like off the stool and laying down to like a more comfortable position. But I remember the midwife and her two assistants and just someone being like, which is like, breast 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 like now's the time and and later I would watch videos of like infants doing the breast crawl or rooting and looking for for the breast and I was like that totally that was not my experience he was just like they placed him right there and there he was um and I ended up nursing for like almost four and a half years Mm -hmm. obviously the first the first year was the most intense of that and at around 10 months, we introduced a formula, I was going to say as a supplement, but now looking back, I'm like, not sure why I was like, maybe I was just getting tired and feeling like I needed a break. Mm. And that seemed like the easiest option. And yeah, so it was a breastfeeding journey that started pretty immediately and continued on for a long time. (laughs) Yeah. And you mentioned your care providers were the people who really influenced you the most when it came to breastfeeding. And you just told the story of them getting him right to your breast and encouraging you to get going with breastfeeding. Were there any ways that they helped you to establish breastfeeding or continue breastfeeding? I was like worried, is he getting what he needs? And so they would teach me how to do diaper checks and how many times, how many wet diapers he should have. 
Yeah, I had a meal train, and so I had looked up a bunch of stuff of like, what's good milk producing foods? Um, they, they honestly, one of the biggest things was that they just had a very committed postpartum care mm. <laughs> um, practice, and so they would just come check up on me. They checked on me, I think, one day postpartum, three days a week two weeks and a month and they came to my house so I had a handful of postpartum visits where it was like the whole the whole point was to check and make sure how we were doing including including the feeding part the other thing is that they introduced me to a woman who would run local mom groups and basically we would all show up and nurse it wasn't marketed as like a breastfeeding group but especially when they were so little we would a lot of times that's just what it was and so we would talk a lot about nursing we would just talk about the challenges talk about what was going well I distinctly remember like one mom had like a one boob thing going and so she like mm -hmm. exclusively nursed from from one side and just remember several conversations we had about just that so being able to have a community of other people in a very similar stage of motherhood where we could talk about pretty much anything related to feeding. Yeah, that is so critical. I think many people who have not experienced that don't understand how much it can improve your postpartum mental health just to sit in a room with other people who are experiencing some of the same joys and frustrations and worries and who are obsessing as much as you are about <laughs> feeding this little baby and their poops and how do you know they're getting enough? Because even your partner, as supportive as your partner might be, they are not experiencing it themselves, um, keeping a baby um, satisfied, satiated, growing with the milk you are producing from your very own body. So there's a different level of, I don't want to say the word obsessive thinking, you know, it's, it's all consuming when you're in it. And just to sit in another room of other people who are also being all consumed by the same um, things is so powerful. So it's interesting that that was a big part of your postpartum experience. Were these people, was this a bilingual group or were you mostly with other um, Spanish speakers? What was the type of community? It was all you in built? Spanish. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it was all in Spanish. That's a good question of, you know, if I had been an English speaking only person, where, where might I have gone? <laughs> Yeah. So you said that you started introducing formula around 10 months. Do you know what your reasoning was at that time? I remember like distinctly, we, we went out on like a first date <laughs> or the first date since having a baby when he was around that age. And I was starting to spend just more time out and he nursed on demand. So part of me wonders if I was like, oh, he needs to learn how to drink from a bottle so that he has some way to get food while I'm gone. Although at that point he was like eating some solids. And I think my husband, as my husband and we had a, a caregiver who helped us as they started doing things like putting him down for naps and getting him to sleep if I was out, I think I just defaulted to like, well, he clearly needs, in my mind, I was like, he needs something to drink that's not from me during those times. Nutritionally, I mean, I don't really think there was any <laughs> rationale for it. Yeah. And you did not consider pumping? I pumped a few times, not like on a frequent basis. And I found it so hard to express any amount <laughs> that would like even halfway fill a bottle and I didn't really have like a stash you know in my freezer or anything interestingly enough when I I well he was about a little over one 
I ended up starting to work outside of a home office and I started pumping much more. And then all of a sudden I had a stash. And at oh, that point, interesting. Like and oh, that's interesting. And was there, did you have access to any lactation professionals? The IBCLC certification is an international certification. So, you know, mm-hmm. I'm in groups where there are people all over the world, but, you know, sometimes they're concentrated in certain countries, you know, you might find them in one city, but not in another. So were there IBCLCs around that you could ask for help from if needed? Yeah, it's a good question of whether they were, they were actually had gone through the lactation consultant training IBCLC. But I did see someone when I got mastitis, and she helped me come up with a plan and think about what to do in that moment and also what to do if it happened again. But I I didn't think to ask what her certification was. Okay. So you mentioned around the year mark, you started working outside of the home. Had you begun working for your own? Did you have a private practice? Yes, I had a private practice and I actually started working very part-time starting when he was pretty young, about six weeks old and did, you know, maybe like four or five hours of work and built, well, double that every couple of weeks until I ended up working part-time pretty much the entire first year and then much more full-time after a year. So does that, in looking back, having started four to five weeks in with some amount of work, did that feel like a necessity at that time? Or did it feel like something you wanted to do just to have something that was not caring for a baby? I really wished I would have had more time. I had this interesting mix of the one-on-one client work I could stop and refer out. And I also worked as a a researcher. And so I had these projects that were midstream, often projects that were anywhere from a year long to five years long based on the funding associated with them. And so I had, I had some projects that I took a very brief break from, and then ended up working on. Um, The nice thing was I didn't have to go anywhere and my baby didn't have to go anywhere. So he was just often right behind me. And, and I was mostly answering emails and taking phone calls and attending some virtual meetings. But I do, I remember feeling really wishing that I had more time of no work at all. That's hard. And did you have a care provider that came in and helped? I know a lot of people who think, oh, I work from home. I'll just take care of my baby and work. And then when they're in the reality of it, babies are pretty needy. You know, you can't always be holding a baby and typing, for instance. So did you have somebody who was helping with care and then bringing him to you to feed? Or what did that look like? I did. So at about six weeks, we were able to find someone who was open to our like very part-time flexible <laughs> schedule needs. Um, and that's basically what we did. I I initially thought I would pump just to, you know, have, like I would have meetings and then have a pump break. And, but again, based on my pumping experience, I was like, during this 20 minute break, it makes more sense for for him to just nurse. And then, and then I go back into meetings. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And she came to our house and was with us yeah, for the first full year. And then after that year, when you started working more regularly, was he, did he still stay at home or did he go somewhere for care? He went into a small like home a little over a year. We did a transition period. So there was a period where he was going two days a week and with my husband the other three days a week. And then eventually after like four or five months of that was there full time. And it was The nice thing was it was around the corner from our house. So Mm. it was a very easy, easy setup. And were you providing, I know you said you started pumping a little more after the one year mark. So were you providing breast milk to the care provider? And what were the attitudes around human milk um, for people in the community who were also caring for your baby? Yeah. So we mostly used the milk that I pumped at home. Like if I was out and my husband was feeding him. At school, we 
used formula for a little while. And then, you know, by the time he was like one and a half, um, they, they had an internal practice of like working with sippy cups or maybe it was even cuts with the lid off at that point. I, I know all, all of the recommendations have changed by this point. Right. Yeah. And so he, he honestly took bottles for much longer at home, like probably two years, which I don't think is recommended anymore than at school. At school, he would drink his water in the cup and at okay. mealtime and, okay. and not really have bottles. And then related to that, how did you feel when you were out and about, both when your baby was an infant and then as he grew older and older? I nursed one of my children until uh, he was three and a half and my daughter I nursed until she was four and a half. And by the time I had my daughter, I was already a lactation professional. I was a peer counselor. I was very steeped in the culture. I was a doula already. I was very steeped in the culture of like birthing and breastfeeding. But the older she got, <laughs> the harder it was for me to just say, yeah, sure, you can nurse here at this part because you fell. You know, it became a little more... Um, I just became a little more self-conscious. So I would love to know what the environment was for you, both breastfeeding in public, an infant, and then as he grew older. Yeah. So what you, your experience definitely resonates with me. I feel like probably until like two and a half, I would pretty much nurse him wherever. And then it was like only at our house or my parents' house. And at that point, like with he didn't really nurse during the day. It was just like comfort nursing at night, basically. Mm -hmm. At, or at nap time and yeah I remember feeling like okay if you want to we can like go into this other room and lie down or something if we're at my parents house for example but also having some sense of like I shouldn't really do, be doing this in public anymore <laughs> should I <laughs> yeah um, it's so interesting because the natural age of weaning is very different child to child. Uh, but there, you know, we just have this pressure. We feel this pressure to not let anybody know that we're still nursing. Did you get any external pressure about that? Or it was all really like the self-consciousness? Self-consciousness. I, yeah, I don't remember anyone ever saying anything to me or feeling like I was being judged externally. Mm hmm. And my partner was like all for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was just like, we honestly, part of it was like, we slept much more if right. there was just comfort nursing going on. So, yeah. Did he nurse all night still as a four-year-old or was it just like a to go to sleep? And to go to sleep. And if he woke up like mid night and he always woke up, <laughs> it was like, he didn't really sleep fully through the night until he was about four. Yep. I think it's important for people to hear that because we have been steeped culturally to expect that our babies should be behaving in a particular way. They should be quiet. They should sleep through the night, you know, really soon if they're needy or want to be held all the time. I see so many parents wanting help with how to fix their babies when this is happening. And in the end, it really is about the temperament of the child. Um, and you could do the exact same thing for three different children and they would, the outcome would be different for each of the three. If you're trying to sleep train or trying to get them not to wake up, was it difficult for you that he was still waking through the night or did it just feel like, well, I have the solution to continue nursing him. So I'm just going to keep doing it for as long as it works. Yeah, I mean, I was definitely tired and drained. And I remember I would go to my community acupressure place because they had a policy that that moms could stay in the chair longer than like the 45 minute oh, window amazing. and you could just like nap. <laughs> so I would do that once a week. Yeah, I mean, I definitely was. don't think I was at my healthiest with the like multiple times a night interrupted sleep for multiple years in a row but I also what I, I don't know if I was so tired that I was like this is the easiest path but the being tired 
for me didn't have any link to like feeling compelled to sleep train or to try and get him to sleep through the night when you know we had tried all sorts of things and it was just like okay this is what he does and I would reassure myself by being like eventually he will sleep through the night he's not gonna be like 15 16 like eventually it'll be hard to wake him up um at like 11 now I have spent some time in Central America both in Mexico and in Honduras and in other places as a visitor but you know more extended periods of time in both um, of those countries and my sense of the people that I knew in the communities I was in was there was less of strict um, bedtime routine for younger children that the that they would sort of just stay up with the adults and be around and part of what was happening with the adults and then as they were tired they would just be tired and go off to bed Um, and I read a book um, hunt parent gather have you read that book i haven't read it but i have heard about it in my neighbors across the street who have two-year-old twins (laughs) yes yes and she describes this as well um that in many places where there's a lot less um you know people are a lot less distraught over you know their parenting choices and there's a lot more harmony within the families that this is more common that kids are just part of the environment and then but it also means that bedtime is a little easier because they're able to pay attention to their own signals a little bit more and say oh you know what I'm I'm gonna go to bed and but they're given that freedom because there's not as much pressure around bedtime did you witness that in your community you know I witnessed it growing up I'd say like my parents very much had the ethos of like, we still have our same life. There's now just like children tagging along. <laughs> so I remember going to a lot of parties and like falling asleep under the dinner table because I was tired and they were still partying. I think imagined ourselves doing that. But then when it came down to it, I think I was much more anxious than I thought I was going to be as a parent. As I would see like a quote unquote bedtime getting near like the time he might normally fall asleep at our house, I would be like, we have, we have to leave. <laughs> I mean, in the early, in the early months, yes, we would like go out to dinner and the kid just like fall asleep in a little carrier and a stroller or whatever. Um, and I do have, we live in the States now, but I would say our friends in Mexico definitely have much more of like a, they'll just fall asleep where, when they need to or wherever they need to and no reason for someone else's bedtime to like put a damper on your plans. <laughs> right, right. It's interesting. I'd love to know if anybody has researched the differences there and on um, outcomes on sleep hygiene as you get older. That would be interesting to look at. Yeah. And now, I mean, it is, it probably does have an impact on their ability to, I mean, we never did things like blackout curtains or anything, but we did, We took him to this poetry festival this summer and it was mostly like Latin American immigrant families in the U S and, and it was getting late. And so at a certain point, a lot of kids just like laid down on two camping chairs put together and he could like not find a comfortable spot. And so we ended up leaving way, way past his bedtime. Benny like fell asleep in the car or something. But it's- I know my kids are the same way. I wanted to know, you mentioned that you had a meal train. And so you researched common foods that are considered galactagogues, milk enhancing foods. And I love getting various cultural perspectives about this because I've gotten to talk to people all over the world. And when you look at the common foods or practices that I recommend, they vary greatly meal. (laughs) So I would love to know what what people were suggesting or what you found in your reading. Were you looking at mostly Spanish language resources or English language resources when you were trying to decide what foods you should be eating in that initial postpartum period? So in terms of things that were informing what the plan was, um, I, I found someone local who did this for a living, helped prepare meals. And a lot of the go-to things locally are things like catole, which is a corn based, like very thick drink, very sweet. Um, and like we had neighbors who were like, oh, chicken, like chicken soup is the thing. And so bring a lot of chicken soup and 
oatmeal, but like a oatmeal water, if that makes sense. Like soaking the oats and then liquefying and it makes like a, a milk. I guess, I guess that would be oat milk. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, made in a blender at home. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I was also very interested. I had a, just a personal yoga practice and I was very interested in like Ayurvedic oh, okay. type things. So anything that was like, Unctuous, buttery, heavy. It was interesting because a lot of the Ayurvedic things started, they would, you know, if you're going to do legumes, like start very small, like lentils. So a lot of people brought me lentils, and my, my midwife was like, no beans, postpartum, no beans. <laughs> Why didn't she want um, you to so have beans? Like postpartum. She was not indigenous, but she had been trained by indigenous midwives. And, and beans are apparently one of the things you're supposed to avoid oh, <laughs> from, wow. from a like traditional foods perspective, the way she was trained, I guess something about like, it creates, you want to avoid like wind, gas, things like that. Don't go out when it's windy. Don't eat gassy foods. And apparently beans, beans will make you gassy. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's so interesting. So then weaning happened at around four and a half. Was this something that happened so gradually that you don't even remember the last time or was it an intentional choice? Yeah, I I do not remember having a moment where it was like, I know this is the last time I'll nurse my baby or my, my, my young man. Yeah, it just eventually he was totally fine. I do remember a couple, like maybe for a week, we purposefully had my husband put him to bed just to be like, not part of our nighttime routine anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it wasn't like a ma major milestone or like a event that I remember. Yeah. But it does sound like you had come to a decision that you were ready because you were intentionally having your husband help with bedtime to try to change it up a little bit. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. thank you so much for sharing your personal experiences. We're going to close this out and then people can come back to listen to your next episode to talk about postpartum planning. Sounds good. Ariana's story is a perfect example of how a great mix of educating yourself and planning and being willing to be flexible in the moment can really set you up to feeling good about your postpartum and breastfeeding experiences. Tune in in just a couple of days to hear how Ariana helps to demystify the postpartum planning experience. And if you are not an avid podcast listener like me, you might not know that the best way to ensure that you can get Ariana's episode is by hitting the follow button on whatever podcasting app you use. It's sometimes a plus sign. It sometimes says follow. Go ahead and follow. This will get the episode right to your phone automatically so you don't have to remember and search for it. And that way you can hear every episode of the Milk Making Minute. And while you're at it, please take a minute to just review the show. If this is a show you have loved and listened to, give it five stars and write a little review. If it's a show that you're not super into and want to be critical about, I don't need your review. Thanks. See you soon.